I clung to the weight of history on my wrist every day. It was a vintage watch, once belonging to my grandfather. More than just a timekeeper, it was a link to the man who had instilled in me a love for stories of the past. After he passed, the watch was all I had to remember him by, a tangible piece of our shared memories. My latest business trip to Chicago was hectic, but successful, and it was only when I was unpacking back home in New York that I felt the nakedness of my wrist. An icy jolt of panic washed over me. I remembered placing the watch on the nightstand each night, the ritual of removing it before bed so distinct. Yet, now I was grasping at the empty air where it should have been. My heart raced as I scrambled for my phone to call Tom, the Airbnb host. With each ring, my stomach knotted tighter, fearing that each passing second was a step further from reclaiming my grandfather's watch. When Tom finally answered, his voice was a calm contrast to the storm of my worries. Hi, Tom. It's Elena. I stayed at your place this past week. I believe I might have left something very important behind, I stammered, the urgency clear in my voice. Of course, Elena. I'll check right away and get back to you as soon as I find anything, Tom replied, his tone reassuring. I hung up the phone, feeling a temporary relief, clinging to hope. But as the hours turned into days, my initial calmness evaporated. I called Tom repeatedly, leaving voicemails that piled up unanswered. Each polite reminder I sent via text seemed to vanish into the void just as my watch had. The lack of response gnawed at me, a constant reminder every time I glanced at my bare wrist. By the third day, my messages became more insistent, and Tom's replies when they came were vague. Still looking, no luck yet, or... I've been really busy, sorry. The tone was always apologetic, but with each passing day, his excuses seemed more like a stalling tactic. My anxiety morphed into frustration and a growing suspicion. Why was he suddenly so hard to reach? The watch wasn't just an accessory. It was a piece of my heritage, irreplaceable and priceless. As Tom became more elusive, I realized I had to take matters into my own hands. The thought of losing something so precious began to torment me, pushing me towards a decision I never thought I'd have to make. My frustration turned to shock one evening as I scrolled through social media. There, on Tom's Facebook profile, was a new photo of him at a local bar, his arm raised, toasting the camera. My heart stopped for a beat. The watch on his wrist was unmistakable. It wasn't just similar to my grandfather's. It was my grandfather's watch. The distinctive engraving on the side, the slightly faded face, the unique way the band clasped, all details I knew by heart. Fueled by a mix of anger and betrayal, I immediately picked up the phone and called him. The friendly tone was gone from my voice, replaced by a steely edge. Tom, I saw the photo you posted tonight. That watch you're wearing, it's mine. My grandfather's watch. How could you? There was a pause on the line, a moment of silence that felt like an admission. Then, Tom's voice, defensive and a little too casual. Oh, that old thing? Look, Elena, you must be mistaken. I bought this watch last week at a flea market. It's just a coincidence they look alike. I pressed him, my voice shaking with emotion. I know my own grandfather's watch, Tom. I know it. Why are you doing this? But he only reiterated his story, growing more dismissive with each exchange. I think you're just confused, Elena. I promise you, it's not your watch. His denials did nothing but inflame my resolve. I sent him an email after our call, attaching pictures of the watch from my grandfather's old photo albums for comparison, demanding that he return it immediately. His responses, however, became even more evasive, filled with excuses and denials. The digital confrontation spiraled as Tom continued to deny everything. Each message from him tried to paint me as mistaken or overly emotional, but I had seen with my own eyes, and his lies only deepened the pit of dread and anger in my stomach. I knew then that I wouldn't let this rest. Resolved to face Tom directly, I booked a ticket back to the city. The flight was a blur of turbulent thoughts, each more troubling than the last. 
I landed with a single purpose. Retrieve what was mine. As soon as I arrived, I drove straight to the Airbnb. My nerves taut with anticipation and anger. I knocked on Tom's door repeatedly, but there was no answer. Frustration mounting, I turned to leave when a neighbor, recognizing me from my previous stay, called out from across the hall. Looking for Tom. He left early this morning, but he's been talking about some big score from a guest who didn't know what they had. Found himself a real treasure, he said. The word struck like a blow. Tom's deceit was not just a private betrayal, but had become a boastful tale of triumph. This revelation fueled a new intensity within me. The neighbor's casual recount confirmed my worst fears. Tom had no intention of returning the watch. He was flaunting his theft as a clever win. This knowledge solidified my resolve. I wasn't just recovering a family heirloom. I was now on a mission to reclaim my dignity and expose Tom's malfeasance. With a deep breath, I stepped away from the door, formulating my next move. The battle lines were drawn, and I was ready to confront whatever came next. Hours later, after staking out his place from a nearby cafe, I saw Tom returning. My heart pounding, I confronted him as soon as he stepped out of his car. Tom, we need to settle this now. That watch isn't yours to keep. Tom's face hardened as he met my gaze. Look, Elena, you left it. That makes it abandoned property. Finders keepers, he sneered, his voice cold and taunting. The air between us crackled with tension as we stood in his driveway, the setting sun casting long shadows. It was not abandoned, and you know it. It's a family heirloom and means more to me than you can understand. I shot back, my voice rising in desperation and anger. Suddenly, Tom stepped closer, his demeanor menacing. What are you going to do about it, huh? You should just go back home. It's mine now, and if you try to get it back, you'll regret it. His threat hung heavily in the air, and for a moment I feared things might escalate to violence. But my resolve hardened. I wouldn't be intimidated. This isn't over, Tom. I'll get my watch back. One way or another, I declared, staring him down my mind racing with legal avenues and potential public exposure for him. As our voices rose, the neighbor, worried by the escalating tension, called the police. Within minutes, sirens cut through the heated exchange. Confronted by the officers, Tom's confidence wavered. Under the stern gaze of the law, he confessed that he knew all along the watch's sentimental and monetary value and intended to sell it. The deception he'd spun so casually unraveled before everyone. By the time the police mediated, Tom, pressured and defeated, handed the watch back to me. With the watch securely on my wrist, I left the city behind, the skyline growing dim in the rearview mirror. Though the physical object was recovered, the experience left a shadow over my memories. The journey home was somber, filled with reflections on human nature's darker crevices. As I drove, I pondered the moral complexities of what we claim as ours, what we lose, and the echoes left by the things, and people, we thought we knew. The story ends, but the questions, like echoes, linger long after. Returning home from what was supposed to be a relaxing getaway, I felt anything but refreshed. The Airbnb, chosen for its charming appearance online, had turned out to be a neglected mess and the host's behavior ranged from unhelpful to downright rude. As a freelance graphic designer, my work often follows me, and the environment had made it impossible to concentrate. Driven by frustration and a sense of duty to other travelers, I sat down and penned a critical but fair review detailing the unkempt conditions and the host's discourtesy. I thought little of it after clicking submit, assuming that was the end of it. However, just days later, the first of several unnerving packages appeared on my doorstep. Each box was plain, unmarked except for my name scribbled across the top in hurried jagged handwriting. Inside, amidst a nest of crumpled newspaper, were broken trinkets, a ceramic piece from a lamp, a shard from a decorative plate, each accompanied by a note with messages that hinted at threats veiled just thinly enough to make my stomach churn. What began as a simple act of feedback had spiraled into something sinister and I couldn't shake the feeling that this was only the beginning. The packages began to arrive with unnerving regularity, 
each delivery more personal than the last. It was no longer just fragments of innocuous household items. Now items distinctly mine were being returned in pieces. A favorite mug I'd accidentally left behind, now shattered. A book I'd read at night, its cover torn. The implications were chilling. This person had cataloged what I'd brought, what I'd touched. The notes grew more aggressive too. No longer just implications, but direct taunts. Miss this? My unease escalated into genuine fear. I reached out to Airbnb, explaining the situation in urgent tones over emails and hurried phone calls. I hoped for a swift resolution, a form of protection, anything. But responses were mired in procedural delays, with customer service assuring me they were looking into it while advising me to contact local authorities. I felt a sinking helplessness, the kind that gnaws at you when you realize you're on your own. With each passing day, as I awaited a more substantial response, the tension twisted tighter around me, making the walls of my own home feel as if they were closing in. One night, as the clock nudged past midnight, the distinct sound of someone tampering with the front door jolted me awake. Heart pounding, I crept to the living room, phone in hand, and dialed the police with trembling fingers. The subtle metallic clicks and scratches of what could only be lockpicking echoed through the silent house. I shouted, I've called the police, hoping to scare off the intruder. Suddenly the noises ceased, and the shadowy outline of a figure darted away from the porch light's dim glow. The police arrived minutes later, but it was too late. The intruder was gone. On the doorstep, they found a note. The words, a bad review returns to haunt you, scrawled across it in angry, jagged letters. The message was clear, and the reality that this situation had escalated to a physical threat was terrifying. Shaken to my core, I took immediate action the following morning. I invested in high-quality security cameras, positioning them strategically to cover all angles of the exterior. I replaced every lock, upgraded to deadbolts, and installed a new alarm system that would immediately alert the authorities in case of another attempt. I walked through my house testing every window, reinforcing any that felt even slightly vulnerable. As I set up the last of the cameras, I couldn't help but feel like a prisoner in my own home, fortifying myself against an enemy who had once just been a faceless name in an online transaction. The weight of every small sound or unexpected shadow now carried a potential threat, and despite my bolstered defenses, the anxiety of waiting for another sign from my relentless harasser was almost worse than the threats themselves. The once comforting solitude of my freelance lifestyle now felt stiflingly isolating, as if the walls themselves were closing in, bearing the echo of that haunting threat. Late one night, while reviewing the footage from my newly installed security cameras, my breath caught in my throat. There, on the grainy screen, was a hooded figure approaching my front door with deliberate, cautious steps. The light barely illuminated the contours of their face, hidden beneath the shadow of the hood. In their hands, they clutched what looked like the remnants of a familiar item from the Airbnb, a small decorative pillow, now torn and soiled. They placed it precisely on the doorstep, a calculated gesture meant to intimidate. After a brief pause, as if ensuring the camera captured their act, the figure retreated into the darkness from whence they came. This new development amplified my paranoia to near unbearable levels. The outside world began to feel increasingly hostile. Friends invited me out, but I declined each offer, too afraid to leave the supposed safety of my fortified home. My social life dwindled to nothing, conversations limited to terse updates and reassurances to worried family members. Despite providing the police with the video evidence, their investigation yielded no substantial leads. The lack of progress, the continued anonymity and boldness of my harasser only deepened my sense of isolation. Each day blurred into the next, a constant cycle of vigilance and dread, making my home feel less like a sanctuary and more like a cell. One evening, as dusk fell and shadows stretched long across the yard, my security alert chimed. The camera feed displayed the now familiar figure, cloaked in a hood, trespassing once more onto my property. My heart hammered against my ribs as I made a decision that mingled desperation with fear. I wasn't going to hide anymore. I stepped outside, confronting the intruder head-on. Enough! I shouted. The figure halted, and slowly, the hood was pulled back to reveal the face of my Airbnb host. His expression was twisted with anger and resentment. You've destroyed my business, he hissed, his hands bawling into fists. 
Words barely left my mouth before he lunged at me, blinded by fury. We grappled in the dim light, his rage meeting my frantic need for self-defense. The struggle was chaotic, filled with the harsh sounds of grunting and the scuffle of shoes on gravel. Eventually, I managed to gain the upper hand, pinning him to the ground as I yelled for help. Breathing heavily, I kept him subdued while I dialed the police with my free hand. The sirens wailed in the distance, a sound that brought with it a promise of resolution, but also a profound sense of violation. As the police arrived and pulled the host away in handcuffs, the reality of how close I had come to serious harm finally began to sink in. We arrived at the Airbnb late in the afternoon, the car filled with the laughter and chatter typical of the start of a family vacation. My wife, Sarah, had spent weeks researching the perfect spot for our getaway, a supposedly charming neighborhood that boasted tranquility and warmth according to the many glowing reviews. The kids, bustling with excitement, pressed their faces against the car windows, eager to catch a glimpse of our home for the next week. As we turned down the street where our temporary home awaited, the cheerful noise inside the car began to dwindle, replaced by an unspoken tension. The houses, lined up like weary sentinels, showed signs of neglect. Their once vibrant colors faded under layers of grime and peeling paint. The streets were quiet, too quiet, and a few scattered groups of people watched us with a stark intensity that didn't match the welcoming tone of our online host's description. Parking in front of the Airbnb, a sense of unease settled over me. The house stood there, its exterior rough and uncared for, a stark contrast to the bright, cheerful photos online. This can't be right, Sarah murmured, frowning as she scrolled through the listing again. But the address matched, and as we unloaded our bags, the sinking feeling that we had made a terrible mistake started to take hold. The first night in the house was restless. As the sun set, the neighborhood's true characters seemed to emerge. Loud arguments spilled out from the nearby houses, punctuated by the frequent wail of sirens that sliced through the night air. Our kids, wrapped in their blankets, tried to sleep through the noise, but their uneasy shifts and whispered concerns told another story. The next morning, we ventured out, hoping to find the vibrant local life that had been so enthusiastically reviewed. Instead, we were greeted by streets lined with barred shops, their sparse shelves stocked with necessities, not the artisanal goods and local produce promised online. The market square, which had been described as lively and bustling, was nearly deserted, save for a few locals who regarded us with indifference. Concerned, I called Mr. Redwood, our host. I'm sorry, but this isn't what we expected based on the listing. The area feels a bit off, I said, trying to keep my tone neutral. His response was swift and curt, a stark contrast to the warm communicator we'd interacted with before booking. You're exaggerating. It's perfectly safe and just as described. You'll get used to it, he said, almost chidingly. There was an edge to his voice that didn't sit right with me. As I hung up, a sinking feeling told me that something was very wrong, not just with the neighborhood but with our host's intentions as well. The dismissive way he had responded was the first real red flag that we might be in a situation far different from what we had imagined. Determined to uncover the truth, I spent hours online while the kids played board games in the living room, their laughter a brief respite from the tension. I scoured social media and travel forums, searching for any information linked to our Airbnb and Mr. Redwood. Eventually, I connected with several previous guests through a travel review site. The picture they painted was starkly different from the glowing testimonials on the listing. One after the other, these past guests shared similar stories. Most unsettling were the accounts of being subtly threatened with extra charges or legal troubles if they left anything less than a stellar review. Some even admitted they were offered a discount on their next stay for positive feedback, which explained the misleading portrayal of both the property and the neighborhood. Sarah and I confronted Mr. Redwood the following day. We met him in the dimly lit living room, the morning sun struggling to pierce through the closed curtains. I laid out our findings before him, presenting screenshots and messages from the other guests. His reaction was a cold chuckle, unnervingly calm. You're letting a few negative experiences cloud your judgment, he said, leaning back in his chair. Why focus on the bad? You're here to enjoy your holiday, aren't you? Don't let a bit of realism ruin your vacation. 
His words were a slap in the face, the veiled warning clear in his tone. He was telling us to ignore our instincts and accept the facade he'd constructed online. The gravity of our situation became painfully clear. Not only were we misled into staying in a place far from the idyllic retreat we had been sold, but we were also dealing with a man who had no qualms about manipulating and dismissing his guests' concerns. The discomfort in the house grew palpable, as did our realization that our family's safety might depend on our next moves. One late afternoon, after a tense day trying to keep the kids entertained within the confines of the Airbnb, we returned from a brief attempt to explore the area further. As we walked in, a chilling breeze greeted us. A window in the living room, which I distinctly remembered locking myself, was wide open, the curtains fluttering. A quick survey of the house revealed subtle disturbances, drawers slightly ajar, personal items not quite where we left them. The unease quickly morphed into paranoia. It felt like a clear message. We were being watched, our complaints noted, our presence barely tolerated. That evening, as dusk settled, the shadows seemed to crowd closer around the house. From behind curtained windows, the occasional flicker of movement suggested watchful eyes. The neighborhood's oppressive atmosphere deepened, the friendly daytime facade slipping as the streets emptied and silence took over. Every attempt to discuss these issues with Mr. Redwood was met with icy dismissals. Better to stay inside after dark, he advised with a tone that hinted it was more of a directive than a suggestion. His warnings left us feeling more isolated, our worries dismissed as if we were merely troublesome guests, not worth the bother. This treatment only served to amplify our growing concerns, that our family was not just stuck in a misrepresented rental, but potentially in real danger. By the end of a harrowing week, the strain was palpable among us. It reached a fever pitch when we found a crudely scrawled note pinned to the front door one morning. Leave or regret staying. The message was clear and menacing. Our hearts sank further when we discovered our phones were missing, likely stolen as we slept, severing our last lines of communication with the outside world. Panic set in as the realization of our vulnerability washed over us. We hastily packed our belongings, intent on leaving this nightmare behind. Rushing to our car, loaded with bags and bundled kids, I turned the key in the ignition, only to be met with the hollow click of a dead engine. My attempts to revive it were futile, it was clear that someone had tampered with the vehicle. Trapped and isolated, our minds raced for solutions. Sarah suggested we seek help on foot, but the thought of leaving the perceived safety of the car in such a hostile environment was daunting. With few options left, we prepared to make our escape on foot. Our senses heightened to every shadow and sound, unsure of what lay ahead in the creeping dusk. In the pre-dawn darkness, with only the essentials in our hands, we slipped out of the house. The air was chilling, thick with tension as we moved quietly down the street. Each of us was alert, eyes darting to any movement, ears straining against the silence of the deserted neighborhood. As we hastened our pace, the unmistakable sound of footsteps echoed behind us. We didn't dare look back, our hearts pounding as the following steps grew louder. It felt like the neighborhood itself was trying to reel us back into its menacing grasp as we desperately pushed towards the main road. Ah. Relief washed over us as we finally reached the main road just as dawn broke the night's hold. A passing driver, seeing our distressed state, stopped and drove us to the nearest police station. There, we recounted our ordeal, the threats and the eerie events, to skeptical but ultimately supportive officers who promised to investigate. Back in the safety of our home, the ordeal at the Airbnb seemed like a distant, dark dream Yet the shadow of what happened clung tightly to our minds. Who really was Mr. Redwood? What were his true intentions? Questions without answers haunted us. To cope and perhaps warn others, we started a blog detailing our experience and the dangers of misleading reviews. Each post was a step towards healing, yet the unease of our experience lingered. A constant reminder of the darkness hidden behind seemingly innocent facades, leaving us and our readers to wonder what lies beneath other glowing reviews.